Here it is, videotape 415, taken 20 years ago, of almost 500 videotapes that we recorded on Betacam three months into the Mormon Trail wagon train. And I'm finally digitizing them all after 20 years, and I'm releasing an interview we did with President Thomas S. Monson, first counselor in the first presidency, who paid a surprise visit to Casper, Wyoming. He was going to Riverton, Wyoming, but he made a detour to do a quick little fireside, and I had the opportunity to interview him in the front of a motor home. It just happened right away. He said, here, go in the front of this motor home, and you can interview President Monson. Well, um, I was looking kind of scruffy. I'd been on the trail for two months, and uh, I didn't look, uh, you know, like uh, someone a general authority would like to interview with. <laughs> So I took uh, Brody Pack with me. He was an intern. He just graduated from high school, Lone Peak High School, and he was getting ready for his mission. He was clean cut, and uh, President Monson fixed his eyes on Brody the whole time while we interviewed. And then President Monson also had his own agenda. He just started talking. We didn't start an interview or anything. He just started talking. I tried to insert uh, questions and so forth. There was another issue that was happening as well, and that was because he okay. paid the surprise visit. It was who should be hosting him, right. the stake in Casper, where he was, or the uh, wagon train itself, for they had designated Brian Hill as the president of the wagon train. He was set apart by Elder Ballard, and he has had his presidency, um, Jared Cornell and Steve Sorensen, and also in that presidency was uh, Mike Dunn. So um, there was a little bit of contention that I sensed when this all happened, and it all came about right away. So I never used, for different reasons, President Monson's interview in Legacy West. We did 13 episodes from the Mormon Trail as it happened um, in 1997. So I never used this interview, but take a look, see what you think. You can see that President Monson keeps glancing away from me uh, because I'm kind of ugly to look at. All floats were horse-drawn. And we went to get a team of horses, and we got to this old livery man, and he said, all my experienced horses are out. But I have a team of young horses, big draft horses. If you're willing to risk it, we'll give them to you. It's for the parade. So we took them, my bishop and I, and they were big animals and frisky. And so here we are in the parade, sitting up on the seat with these uh, huge Percheron horses. And we marched down Main Street okay, but then a band in front of us began to play. And one of those big horses reared right up on his hind legs and got crossed over the double tree, you know, and they were flailing around. And the bishop said, Tom, get down and hold the bridle. I was only, what, 17? I said, okay, dumb me. I got off and I was thin like you are. And I got up there and grabbed the bridle, bridle and he could have flipped me over his head, that horse, but I got him calmed down. And when we finished the parade at Liberty Park, they heard the trumpet again, and they spooked and ran right through a chain link fence. <laughs> Didn't hurt them, wrecked the fence. We were very happy to get that team of horses back, and I've never had the lines in my hands on a team of draft horses since that day. Really? But I imagine... Didn't have outriders like they do on this. No, thing. no, it was all up to us. But I'm, I'm intrigued by uh, the originality of people to come up with such an idea. You know, Spencer W. Kimball and others did this in uh, 1947, commemorating the 100th anniversary. They were a little different mold, though. They built a covered wagon around a car. Yeah. They were all their cars, you know. But these people, they've decided we're going to be pioneers. And I imagine they could tell you some stories that would curl your hair. Yeah. What, a, what an exercise in learning to get along with each other. Because people are still people. And uh, missionaries find out. You've been on a mission yet? Six months. Well, missionaries find out that some companions they get along a little better with than others. And same with people. You, you find that the nerves get a little frayed. But my cousin is presiding over the uh, mission in Omaha. Jack Bangeter, his oh, name is. Big guy. We met him. His middle name's Monson. His mother and my father were brother and sister. But he has said this has been the best thing that's ever happened in Nebraska. I said, how about Big Red football team? Oh, Big Red football, nuts. He said, this is really ahead of all that. 
But I, I think the imagination has caught fire and intrigued the people of America. The publicity to the church favorably, I think is absolutely tremendous. And it's not really church sponsored. Maybe that's salvation. I don't know, but uh, it, it could be. But what, I, I admire them. What kind of ancestry did you have uh, across the plains? Well, I take my wife. She had none. Her mother and father were both born in Sweden. So no pioneer ancestry. But my, my uh, mother's grandfather, he came from Scotland. <coughs> he and his little family came to <coughs> New Orleans and up the river to St. Louis. And then they were to work in St. Louis a year and outfit <coughs> themselves to go across the place. You want to give me a little drink of water there, Fran? Please. And they got in St. Louis just in time for a cholera epidemic. And my great-grandmother was 13. And she lost her father and her mother and two brothers all within one week in St. Louis. And as an orphan, 13 years old, she came across the plains with her brothers and sisters. They hitched a ride with her sister and husbands covered wagon. So they came into the valley <coughs> in that condition. They also lost a child at sea. But perhaps my father's, my mother's father's situation would be a little more interesting. He was a convert in Sweden and he got on the ship with his family and came to Liverpool where the British converts got on the ship. And during the trek across the ocean, they too lost a little one. It must have been terrible to wrap them up and <coughs> put a weight on the body and sink it down to the bottom. There were so many children died that they ran out of weights and they had to just wrap them in canvas and then they'd be floating on top of the water as far as the mother and father could see. Great trial. And in that family, the Condy family, C-O-N-D-I-E, they were Scottish coal miners. And uh, in that particular family, uh, they came at about the same time as my father's uh, father and his wife. He fell in love with a little English girl on the ship. And she was younger than he, so he waited seven years for her to grow up, like Rachel in the Bible. And after, eight, after those years, seven years, he married her. And I have his missionary journal. It's written in pencil. He said, today is the happiest day of my life. Today, my sweetheart and I, Mariah Mace, were married for all eternity in the Salt Lake Temple. I am happy. Three days later, the entry reads, tonight, the bishop came to our house. And I've been called to go back to Sweden for a two-year mission. My wife of three days <laughs> will remain at home and support me, and back to Sweden he went. And so that's a, that's a touching thing. I'm jumping between father and mother, so I want you to be real careful. But the other side of my wife's family, that would be her, uh, her, her father's family. They were in Sweden, as I've indicated to you, and our family, my grandfather collected the tithing from her grandfather way back in 1897. Now, we're kind of a different pair. We're the same age. Our mothers were carrying us at the same time. I lived on West 5th South. She lived on East 5th South. I went to West High School, the tough one. She went to East High, the, uh, some a little more money, you know. But nonetheless, we met. And uh, after a long courtship, I had to go in the Navy for a bit. Why we, we married 49 years ago, come uh, October 7th. And so when I consider of my great-grandmother losing uh, her family at St. Louis, I'm grateful that her Condi family, her father's family, uh, one was asked to go to the rescue of the pioneers. And when I looked at the bronze plaque in the visitor center yesterday, in the second column, it had those who, those who went to the rescue. In the second column was the name Gibson Condy. And I have here 
a word from Gibson Condy. I'm just going to read it to you. This is just one little excerpt from his journal. They spelled a little differently then. They spell canyon with a K. They spell like it sounds. He said this. In October conference, they called upon the brethren with their teams to take provisions, wearing apparel, stockings, and go to meet the companies of saints as they were destitute. President Brigham Young went. I thought this is very interesting. President Brigham Young, Mike, went, but he was taken down sick. He tried to go himself. That, to me, is a very significant thing. Amen. He went as far up the canyon as he could. He was obliged to come home. There's a whole sermon in that sentence on leadership. There were a good many of the brethren with their teams who took provisions, etc. The teams were loaded. It was getting late in the season. They were anxious to help the poor saints. He said they went back as far as 400 miles with their teams. They found the companies in a deplorable condition. Their cattle had died. They were obliged to leave their wagons, the handcarts in the Martin Company. They had to leave them. A great many died of starvation. Not much to eat, short rations, and many froze to death. The snow was deep. This is a good line. Death stared before them. hindering their progress from traveling. It was very dark. Death stared before them 400 miles from the valley, but Providence smiled on them. I love that comparison. That's great journalism for a man who doesn't spell that well. He goes on to say, Our brethren with their teams from the valley gave them fresh courage, giving them flour, meat, onions, etc. The brethren wept when they heard of their suffering. In one day they buried 11. My bishop called on me, writes Gibson Condy, to drive an ox team, three yoke. So I hauled a load of hay to meet the companies for their horses and mules as the feed, their feed was covered with snow. I then went and got everything ready to start. I traveled as far as the foot of Big Mountain. Couldn't go any further on account of the snow being so deep. We left the team at camp. I went with a few more brethren with our shovels, that's all they had, to clear the road. They were drifted with snow. When we reached the top of Big Mountain, the snow was 16 feet deep on the road. We all went to work and cleared the snow for the teams to pass as there was a large company just on the other side of the mountain and they had to get through. We were just in time to assist them by clearing the road for them. We all descended down from Big Mountain to camp. It was dreadfully cold and stormy. We had to have large fires burning all night to keep from freezing to death. My feet were frozen. I could hardly walk, but I was so glad we came in safety. Then listen to the celebration. November 30th, the last companies arrived in Salt Lake City on Sunday. The streets were crowded to see the emigrants. President Jedediah I. M. Grant, who had been sick, asked his attendants to carry him to the window so he could see the emigrants passing the house. That would be Heber J. Grant's father. Bishops with their counselors were on hand to see the emigrants had places to go and be cared for. It was a sad time for the poor saints to suffer as they did. Everyone was taken in. I like that. Everyone. Nobody was left out from that company. Then he goes on to say, if the handcart company had left the States two months sooner, they might not have suffered as they did. That's one reason I'm here. Okay, That's any other questions? Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Okay. You get me going, I won't quit. <laughs>